Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we're delighted that you've welcomed us into your home, and we know what a privilege it is. Mm -hmm. So we want to hear from you. Send us an email with your question or your comment about today's show to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Well, today we have a wonderful guest again for you. Her name is Kathy Duffy. She is the author of a wonderful book called Every Day Evangelism for Catholics. Do Catholics evangelize? Should we be evangelizing? You could go to her website, evangelismforcatholics.com. Calm. The answer to those questions is yes, yes. <laughs> and yes. Yes. But you know, back in the day, you really, um, it was really more in Protestant land where there was a lot of evangelizing going on. Yeah. I mean, when we were in the, in the Episcopal Church and uh, there were so many techniques and methods, yeah. we did go door to door, knocking <laughs> on doors, um, you know, asking them if there was anything we could pray for them and did yeah. they know Jesus and what could we do? Yeah. Do Catholics do that? Should they do that? Yes. 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 Um, but uh, the title is Everyday Evangelism for Catholics. And you know, as I was looking at this, you know, speaking to the common person like you and me, and I'm thinking about the story of the Gerasene demoniac. And it's a powerful story that this guy is possessed with demons, and he's, he's chained, but he's breaking the chains. Nobody can control him. He encounters Jesus. And Jesus you know, delivers him. And of course, they go into the swine and that whole story of the swine drowning and so on. But just imagine being delivered from a legion of demons. Mm -hmm. and, and then he said, he lays himself you know, prostrate and he says, Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to be with you. you know, but Jesus says, no. So no, you can't be one of the 12. You can't be in this inner circle. Not because you're anything less. It's not your calling. What was the calling? Go to your town. Mm. Go to your family. What do you want me to do, Jesus? Tell them about God's pity, God's mercy upon you, and what it's like to be delivered from demons. I don't know if you said all that, but I'm <laughs> saying that. You know, and that, that's what this book is about. Right. You know, but if you're not delivered from anything, what do you got to say? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we're doing God a favor. I'm a Catholic. Really? Mm -hmm. Has he delivered you from anything? Right. And maybe that's the problem why we're not telling people. This guy knew he was delivered. Right. And, and certainly if we look at our lives and, and our sins and things that we've done, and we want to be this way, but we're not that way, like St. Paul. But we're supposed to evangelize in our homes and in our communities and in our parish and, and people that, that come our way. Go and tell people about the pity of Jesus Christ upon you because the world needs to hear that so much. Yes. And then maybe even pray with somebody and let them encounter Jesus in a more significant way. Yeah, and I, I think the language is different, you know, in Protestant and Catholic land. But the deal is, as Catholics, we have an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in our reception of him in the Eucharist. Yeah. We have, and that's an, you don't get any more intimate than that, going to adoration and those intimate encounters that we have that we should burst forth from those experiences and say, I've had an encounter with Jesus and look what he's done for me. I'm yelling less. I am being a nice person. <laughs> I am doing um, acts of mercy, Amen. corporal spiritual works of mercy, yeah. because Jesus is living inside of me, not for your own glorification, but for the glory of our good God. Well, every Catholic is called to be a missionary of human dignity, redeemed by the cross, and you were sent by God to evangelize the world. And Kathy Duffy is going to help us with that everyday evangelism for Catholics. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. You're going to get equipped for evangelization. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today we have a beautiful guest. She came all the way from California. Her name is Kathy Duffy. She's the author of a great book called Everyday Evangelism for Catholics. You could go to the website evangelismforcatholics.com. Well, Kathy, we want to welcome you to At Home, and we're delighted to have you. Oh, now, Jim Pinto, here. when he became a Christian, he was like set on fire and he was a born evangelist. I was like, what has happened to him? He would talk to anybody and everybody. 
I didn't, yeah. that wasn't my calling, it was his calling. <laughs> but so tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got involved in this beautiful ministry of evangelism. Yeah, like, like most people, it, the journey isn't just one straight road. But I was raised Catholic, went through Catholic schools, and like so many Catholics, I left <laughs> when I was a you know, young adult and ended up coming back to God when I got pregnant. You know, what am I going to do? I've got this child. I know God is real. I've been playing this game where I'm telling him to leave me alone, but, yeah. you know, I know he's real. So I uh, went back to church, but ended up at Protestant church, Calvary Chapel, mm -hmm. like okay. so many Catholics, yeah. and was there for more than 20 years. We got very involved, helped start a branch of Calvary Chapel. I started their Sunday school. Along the way, we started homeschooling our children, and I ended up teaching about worldview. Uh, what do you believe? How does it affect mm -hmm. everything? And I was teaching parents, children, teaching at conferences. And then I got into apologetics conversations with people, with other things I was doing, people with no faith at all. And all of this forced me to really think through what I believed, why I believed it. Yeah. Really pushed me. And at, you know, over the years, I kind of ran up against a problem where I couldn't couldn't defend, this sounds very nitpicky, I couldn't defend the canon of the New Testament, why we have wow. certain yeah. books in the mm -hmm. New Testament. It sounds like a little thing, but it turned it's out big. to be the mm -hmm. linchpin yes. mm -hmm. because it was about authority. Yes. Does the Catholic Church have authority or not? What does Protestant authority rest on? They say Bible, but the Bible, it depends on the church. Right. And once I realized that I had no choice but to come back to the church. It was, you know, That was a linchpin in my coming home as well. It, it is. Because it's I was, you know, I, I, I'm a revert like yourself and departed from the church um, you know, at a particular time and got involved with wonderful people, you know, evangelical community, yeah. Pentecostal community, charismatic Anglicans and so on, and learned so much, you know, yeah. among them, as I'm sure you did at Gallup. Well, that's where I fell in love with scripture. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. But then you asked the question, that was one of the questions, I fell in love with scripture too, uh, but it did concern me. I said, well, there's six or seven more books of the Bible yeah. here, and they're not there, and I love the Bible. Well, what Bible should yeah. we be reading here, and what, what's the history of this thing? That was a big part of it, yeah. and you're right. You know, by what authority? Yeah. Who says what's in there? Who said it can't be changed, you know, these books? Yeah. And what's that all about? And that really did begin a journey for me. So that, that's a good question. We love the Bible. We're going to have all the books of mm -hmm. them. Right. And, and read yeah. them and love them and pass them on to our children and grandchildren. But go ahead. Share more about your... Well, it was journey. not an easy thing because my whole life, our family, we were right. so involved, yeah. as, as you would know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Coming from the Protestant world, everything centered around mm -hmm. the church, as it used to do with Catholics, right. not mm -hmm. so much as anymore. But um, my business, I had a business related mm -hmm. to homeschooling, everything. I knew it was going to affect everything. Affect everything mm -hmm. drastically, and it did. Um, but I didn't see that I had a choice. I tried to straddle the fence for, mm -hmm. you know, six months or so and just felt like such a hypocrite. I couldn't yeah. do that. So did it, just that was my blind leap of faith. Was the God crisis really guaranteed. what you just said? It was the books of the Bible, which Bible? Or were there more things that led up to that? Um, no, that, that, it, that really, it really, really was, was that, that mm -hmm. because, but it took word. me six years working through that question yeah. and finding out it was the authority question yeah. and, you know, kind of working it through and talking to people. I, I wanted to give the Protestant world plenty of room to talk me out of this because I didn't right. want mm -hmm. to go back to the mm -hmm. Catholic Church. Right. And, so um, really it's the books of the Bible, which Bible, but it's authority. It's authority Who is the real question. Who said this is the mm -hmm. canon, mm -hmm. yeah. but the canon can't change and so on, and then you kind of get into the establishment of the church and yes. Christ giving church authority to those apostles yes. and so on. Is this true or isn't it true? Yeah. And what is this about? And then you became right. convinced that it, yeah, it is. Yeah, because true. from the Protestant end, if you're depending solely on the Bible, the Bible is your bottom line. Yeah. If you can't be sure that you've got the right books in your Bible, right. what have you got? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was Did you find in yeah. your, in when you were in Protestant land that you were evangelizing um, Catholics who also left the Catholic Church. <laughs> I ended up, interestingly, not many of those conversations. Mm -hmm. I had more conversations with people who were from Jewish, agnostic, mm -hmm. um, 
unbeliever. Yeah. I, it was kind of unusual, the kind of people I was around. Mm -hmm. so, so it was really a matter of discipleship for a lot of people, having that conversation, listening. Mm -hmm. How important is mm -hmm. listening when you're evangelizing someone? I think listening is the most important thing, and it's actually the easiest entry place for so many people, so many of us Catholics, we feel like, oh, we don't know how to evangelize. Yeah. You start with listening. Mm -hmm. Because when you're talking with somebody and you're hearing them, really listening, hearing them and asking questions that show that you really want to know and you care, it doesn't take too long to get to the problem, something they're struggling with. Everybody's got something mm -hmm. difficult going on in their lives. And it gives you an opening to pray with them, to introduce them to God if they don't know God. It's a very natural, comfortable way to mm -hmm. evangelize people, not by giving them information. People don't want your information. You listen, you care, then you can walk them towards God. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it's you, really you, about you, the encounter of the other, right? Yes. So, when, so who, who are you evangelizing? How do you go out? Is it your family? Is it <laughs> your church community? Do you go door to door? I mean, we went door to door. It was rather scary, but we did it. <laughs> I love it. I, anything you and did. everywhere. You uh -huh. know, it's like before I got on the plane <laughs> to come, I pray, you know, I pray, right. God, give me opportunities. And I was very disappointed. I didn't, mm -hmm. people were on their headsets right. everywhere. I didn't yeah. get any opportunities to yeah. have a good conversation on the way here. But um, wherever, whenever I go, wherever I go, yeah. so family, friends, I, you know, relatives, church, um, I set up a table at church in the courtyard on Sunday mornings, got faith questions, want mm -hmm. prayer, and people, visitors, Catholics, anybody can come up and... Where do you set this up? In church. the courtyard. Okay. In, we're in California, yeah. mm -hmm. so we can do this yeah. most of the year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just set it up in the courtyard there. That's great. And yeah. people come up and we pray, we talk, you know, some people, um, some people will come to uh, return to the church from a right. conversation. You mm -hmm. never know. You never mm -hmm. know what's going to come from those conversations. Yeah. Well, speak so. to us about um, our history is a long history of 2,000 years you know, in, in the Catholic Church, more. Um, so we just weren't founded yesterday or whatever. Yeah. And so there's been ebbs and flows regarding the discussion of evangelization. Yeah. It's always been going on, but sometimes maybe in a more heated, passionate way than others. But speak to us about the current status of evangelization within the church, maybe the last 50, 60 years. Yeah. More conversation? Is there more training going on? Is there greater interest? Um, because there's a lot of people that, you know, just heard what you said about setting up a table and sharing with people and saying, like, I can never <laughs> no. do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so know, just tell us about the, the status of evangelism within the Catholic Church and yeah. what you're finding. Yeah, I think because, and especially in the United States, for so long we had the large immigrant populations with Catholics and the churches were full and the priests had their hands full just, uh, you know, dealing with the needs of their congregation. Who wants to go out and evangelize and bring more people and we're right. crowded, we're busy, right. we don't need, you know, yeah. we don't need to go find more people. Yeah. Uh, but our last three popes particularly have been very strong on evangelism. Yeah. Uh, Pope Francis wrote The Joy of the Gospel mm -hmm. about evangelism. So they've been bringing it to the forefront. Uh, the fact that we've been losing Catholics has been a wake-up call to mm -hmm. many people in the church. I yeah. think um, the statistic, the latest I saw from the Pew study, was that for every Catholic that joins, say, at Easter Vigil, mm -hmm. for every person that becomes Catholic, we lose six or more. Mm. That's mm -hmm. startling. You think how those numbers yeah. multiply. Right. So people are paying attention and saying, yeah, maybe we maybe we have to go out and start reaching other people. Mm -hmm. We're not a comfortable right. club here mm -hmm. that we can just, you know, be working at maintenance mode. Yeah. We've got to be reaching out. We've got to be reaching out to people without doubt, without question, and yet we have to be reaching into the people that God's bringing us. So that's a, a big part of your book. Yes. That we're not even sensitive, attentive, praying Right. Because there's so many teachable moments yes, yeah. you know, that, that come to us in people. Yeah. We're just thinking about our own grandkids. Yeah. So we have 17 living grandchildren and eight that are with the Lord. So these 17 lately, it's been like this one's making First Holy Communion. This one's making confirmation. And, of course, they're getting, it seems like, you know, very good training. Um, but we want to be sure they hear from Grandma and Grandpa. Yes. You know, like yeah. what the Eucharist means to me. Right. But how many... Catholic grandparents 
how many of their children are still attending mass, much less their grandchildren. grandchildren. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is common right. right now. They're just drifting away, drifting away. And so uh, you're lucky if, you know, one or two of mm -hmm. your grandchildren are even going to mass. Yeah. So there's your starting place, right. your just natural right. starting place with, you know, those around you. Right. Well, it's a matter of really having a conversation with our children. We are really blessed. All of our children are in church. All of you, our grandchildren yes. are, you it's know, they are being catechized properly. But it is, you do have the conversations about the Eucharist or what happens to you, Nona, in adoration. And, yes. you know, so you can have these beautiful conversations. One's off at college and she, um, they're a Baptist family, and so she's really being bombarded with the world and how she has to defend her faith. And she's yes. inviting her teammates to church, you know, and, and they laughed at her because she was reading her Bible. And she was, oh, yeah. they were like, you believe in the Bible? And she was like, yes, I believe yeah. in the She's never encountered people that didn't believe in the Bible, you know, and yeah. it wasn't until she went off to college. But you have to be equipped to share. Yeah. Right, you have to know what you're sharing. If you haven't have an intimate union with Jesus, and you know that He hasn't changed your life, it's just religion, okay. right? But we want more than that. Yeah, if if it's not real to you, you you don't have anything to share. You have to have that relationship with God first to be able to share it with others. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think are the key reasons for people's fear of evangelism, or that I I could never do this, or uh, what do you think, I'm Billy Graham or something? Well, you know, I think, like, yeah, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know. yeah, I like, think so that's... So what, what are the fears? Why are they afraid? Why are because so we have afraid? this picture in our mind that evangelism is for people who are the televangelists, the pastor, somebody who's gone to seminary, you know, and we have that image of the evangelist, the person on the street corner or pounding on their Bible or something mm -hmm. obnoxious, yeah. uh, all the negative connotations. My experience of evangelism is that Friendship evangelism mm -hmm. is the most effective, and it's practical for everyday Catholics, mm -hmm. for all of us in our normal circumstances. It is not something that you have to uh, have special training. You do need to know your faith at a certain level. You can't be totally ignorant of your faith and try to pass that on. Yeah. But it is something accessible, but we're not familiar with it because we don't see it modeled for us very mm -hmm. much. Okay, so. Friendships. So I friendships. know my friends, but it's also developing friendships or trust yes. with people who you might not know all that well, but for some reason you're having a conversation or something's going on. Yeah. You're listening, yes. which is really an act of love and very rare in today's society. Yes. And sacrificial, right. oftentimes, to be able to listen to people. Oftentimes you have to put aside yourself, your, what I'd like to talk about. I want somebody to listen to me. But to just be there, to be available to somebody, it's very sacrificial. Yeah. yeah. And w what a gift it, it is. is. When you say evangelism, do evangelism, what would you say? I know it's, it, you can, there's books written on evangelism. You actually wrote a book on evangelism. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you know, it, just like uh, in a kernel, like what do you mean when you say evangelism? What's, what does it mean? What should I be sharing? What's the core of that? Yeah, just sharing the good news of the gospel, that God loves us, that he wants to bring us into relationship with him, that he has a good life for us, there is a purpose to our life, that we yeah. have eternity to spend with him. Mm -hmm. You know, the simple message of the right. gospel. Yeah. It's so important. We, I encounter girls come into the center. Some are Christians, some are just being, doing Jesus their own terms, you yeah. know. And you really get to encounter them and to s hear their heart, but yet to affirm them and to say, you know, you're a good girl. And I understand you've been through a really hard time. You know, so you can hear their heart, you can identify with their misery and pain, right. and you can say, even, even if it's like, um, you could just say, God has a plan for your life, and this might not be it. If yeah. you ever want to talk about it, I'm here. Right. You know, you just throw them a lifeline, yeah. you know, and then they step away from it and they'll think, oh, that, that was really helpful for me. And the next time I have a conversation, I'm gonna ask her about that, right? Yes. So it's not like one and you're done. Like, no. I talked to you about that and it's over. It's about ongoing relationship because you can't just lay it all out there, mm -hmm. usually in that first conversation. But you develop trust, we're talking about the thresholds in the book, yeah. where you work through these stages of relationship. Where you, first you're developing trust. That's so important mm -hmm. that you take time to do that because then they will come back to you. Mm -hmm when there's something else. And right. I've, I've seen this, you know, relationships with friends and family, you know, where people 
they'll start out, you know, they're wary, mm -hmm. you know, they know, you know, you, you go to church here, mm -hmm. you know, but um, yeah, they so, come around over time. So trust is like the first threshold. Trust is the first threshold. Yeah. Can you list, the, we only got a minute, but can you name okay. the... Yeah, five thresholds that people typically go through in that process of moving from, you know, non-belief or, you know, any, wherever they are, but towards a you know, full relationship with Jesus. They start with trust, then curiosity, then openness, then serious seeking, mm -hmm. and then conversion or I, I would call it intentional discipleship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have to be ready at all those stages. Yes. Sometimes they come in at different places because somebody yes. else has planted mm -hmm. seeds. That's right. right. Let's take a break at this point. We're going to hold you over okay. and we're going to share more about everyday evangelism for Catholics. Evangelismforcatholics.com. You're called to be an evangelist. If you're a Catholic, mm -hmm. Christian, you are called to evangelize the world beginning with your own family. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, we are visiting with Kathy Duffy, but before we continue this beautiful conversation, we're going to hear from Catherine Hadro, who is the host of EWTN Pro Life Weekly. Now, Catherine, we hear you you're commemorating a special occasion to this show, and tell us why. Hi, Jim and Joy. Yes, yes, we are so excited over here because this week marks EWTN Pro Life Weekly's. 100th episode. Time has flown. I loved sharing our first 100 shows with you, and I'm looking forward to many more. To mark this special occasion, we will have highlights and some of my favorite stories from our first 100 episodes. We will also have a discussion with Marjorie Danenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List, and our own EWTN CEO, Michael Warsaw, to discuss the vision behind the show and the pro-life impact it's had so far. And speaking of pro-life impact, remember, every week we share our pro-life call to action. It's a way for you to help advance the pro-life movement and to get involved yourself. To find out this week's call to action, simply go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Again, that's ProLifeWeekly.com. You can catch all of this and more on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly at 10 p.m. this Thursday and again on Sunday at 10 a.m. I hope to see you all there. But for now, back to you at home. Congratulations, Catherine and Pro-Life Weekly. What an incredible impact they are having on people personally, the church, and the world. Way to go. So, Kathy, we're speaking about everyday evangelism for Catholics. And so people are coming to us. We're going to people. And sometimes we kind of prejudge or make assumptions. Yes. Is that a good thing, bad thing? Assumptions in yeah. evangelization. I, I, I address this in the book because I think it is so important that we don't assume anything when we want to bring someone into a, a stronger relationship with God or a relationship if they have no, so often we start in the wrong place. Um, I, I think very typically of the mom whose adult son has stopped going to church and so she's just nagging him to go to church yeah. and well that's just a turn off because she doesn't take the time to find out where he's really at, what he's really thinking. Yeah. He doesn't even know if he believes in God mm -hmm. and she's telling him well you have to go to church and it doesn't Right. It, it just tr drives him away. He doesn't want to deal with that because he has a much more fundamental thing going on mm -hmm. there that's a problem. Um, you can't talk to someone assuming that they believe any one particular thing. You need to let them tell you what they believe yeah. first. I mean, we all know Catholics uh, who even go to church fairly regularly who don't hold Catholic yeah. beliefs. Mm -hmm. We run into this frequently. So it's a very, uh, very real problem when you're talking to somebody. If you start making assumptions, you start talking as if they're already in a certain place, they're going to just, mm -hmm. they're going to yeah. tune you out because you're not, you're just going right past each other. Well, that is absolutely critical in the conversation, that's for sure. Kathy, thank you so much for beginning the process and opening <laughs> up uh, your teaching in Everyday Evangelism for Catholics. Go to Evangelism for Catholics. Dot com. Every Catholic is called to be a missionary of human dignity. You're sent by God to evangelize 
this world. You can do it. Just say, I once was blind, now I see. Jesus did it for me, can do it for you. Let's pray about it. It could be that simple. And Christ is longing for people's hearts. Keep it on EWTN. You're an important part of this family. You are always at home with Jim and with Joy. Bye now.